policies like affirmative action have hampered black upward mobility. Uh, and we, you know, we've had affirmative action policies in place for a half century now. So we don't have to speculate about uh, what will happen. There's some natural experiments out there that have already occurred. The University of California system, back in the mid-1990s, ended race-based admissions throughout the entire University of California system. After it did that, black graduation rates went up, and not by a little bit, by more than 50%, including in the harder disciplines, the more challenging disciplines of math and science and engineering. Grade point averages uh, of, of 3.5 or higher among blacks increased by more than 50% after the University of California system ended racial preferences in college admissions. So a policy that had been put in place to increase the ranks of the black middle class, to increase the number of black doctors and lawyers and engineers, had in practice led to fewer of these individuals than we would have had in the absence of the policy. So aside from whether you think affirmative action is constitutional, um, uh, or makes sense in an increasingly pluralistic society to have a racial spoil system like that in place. Uh, the other question is whether it actually works. And I would argue that 50 years of it shows that it is not working as intended. Uh, comment from you, uh, Nick, uh, on anything that Jason has said. Uh, the question. Oh, well, there, there's no question that affirmative action has worked to expand the ranks of the black professional managerial class over the last like 40, 50 years. There's no question. Um, and, and that's been shown by countless studies. Um, the University of California example, I don't know for sure that what was just said is exactly right. One thing that definitely happened after affirmative action was outlawed in the University of California system was that the flagship campuses saw a tremendous drop in uh, African American and Latino uh, enrollments and black and Latino enrollments went up at the at the satellite campuses so there was less access to some of the premier parts of the University of California system uh, when affirmative action went out but the, the 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 real issue for me and I think the really important issue is is that we spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about the number of like black students that get into Harvard or whatever, and we actually don't think about the whole educational landscape and how it was transformed since the 1970s. Public higher education was free in the University of California system until the 1970s. It was free in the city of New York until the 1970s. So now we know what, what's happened since that time is, is that public higher education has become extremely expensive the greatest barriers to going to school for people are the cost. That's the greatest barrier, and that's the one thing that, can't seem, that, that we can't seem to reduce, right? What did we get since the 1970s? We got cheap electronics, and we got costly education. We got cheap consumer goods, and we got really expensive health care. We got a lot of cheap things that kind of made us ha have a feeling that we have a decent standard of living, but the cost of housing skyrocketed. So this is about political economy, right? And I really think that these are the things that we should be talking about, because when we're talking about people of modest means, people who, are, who have to work for a wage, people that don't have inherited wealth, people that come into the world with disadvantages based upon past discrimination, then these are the things that really matter. And affirmative action has helped in some realms where it was designed to do so. It has helped to diversify the professions. It has especially helped white women. Yale's faculty in 1976 was 1.6% women. It's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Can you believe that? 1.6% women. And now it's closer to 50%. That's a good thing. That was part of what affirmative action did. It didn't just do stuff for African Americans. It's not just a policy that was even just about African Americans. It was about the gendered and racial segmentation of the professions. And that changed since the 1970s in a way that's a really, really good thing for our society. Whether it should continue now, and what should be the policy now, 
is an open question, and I'm certainly willing to have that conversation. Oh. Um, I guess, Jason, what, perhaps you can have an exchange. Jason just wanted I, to make a comment. Yeah. The professor says as if it's just uh, as true as the fact that the sky is blue or water is wet, that affirmative action um, is, is working. And, and that it is increasing the ranks of the black middle class. Um, again, there was a black middle class before affirmative action. It has continued to grow, but at a much lower rate. I quoted Robert Putnam directly, who looked at this data and said, despite the fact that white educational gain attainment was also rising between 1940 and 1970, black educational attainment was rising even faster before 19, between 1940 and 1970. But after 1970, that catch-up progress drastically slowed in the case of high school and actually ended in the case I of mean, college. This is, a, this is a math problem. When you're talking about growing from a really tiny base, no, of no, course no, the rate that, is faster. I address that. I, we're not talking about simply absolute gains. We're talking about gains Relative, black gains relative to white gains. Whites weren't standing still. They were advancing as well, and blacks were catching up at a much, much faster rate prior to affirmative action in higher education than they were in the, in the, during the affirmative action era. That is the point. The issue is to judge the value of these policies, and I think you can compare them. Using empirical data, what was going on pre-1970, what's been going on since? And the data shows that faster progress was taking place in the pre-affirmative action era. I don't, I don't think the data actually shows that. Do okay. you have data okay, that um, shows um, I guess you've, quote, you've quoted Robert Putnam. You've and quoted I quoted one, Stephen one per, Abigail Thernstrom. Yeah, I could also right. quote Richard Vetter. And they're quoting and census and I, data. And I've also just quoted, quoted statistics. Har Harvard's faculty in the 1970s had zero black faculty among the tenured flat faculty in the early 1970s. It's about 8% now. So you can look across the universities in terms of the diversification of faculties and student bodies since the 1970s. And uh, there were black people who taught at Ivy League institutions I'm saying prior the, to I'm 1970. Saying, I'm saying among the tenured faculty in, the, in yeah. arts and science. Tom Sowell taught at Cornell. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm talking about, uh, I, was, I mentioned Harvard just then. But I'm not saying that there was no, there were no black faculty at any, uh, uh, in any institutions of higher education. Of course, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that those numbers have absolutely increased substantially. And only because of affirmative action. Not only because of affirmative Without action. Without affirmative action, blacks can't te teach in the Ivy. No, no, no. That's not at all what I'm saying. That is not what that is not what I'm saying. I'm saying affirmative action policies have been part of the diversification of higher education in a way that has been helpful and in a way that has actually worked. That's what I'm saying. That, that's um, all I'm saying. It's really simple. Derek Bach, who is president of Harvard, wrote The Shape of the River in 1976. They studied s several hundred. No, 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 no. no. That I mean, came it, out it came in the 1980s, but 1990s. the study is based upon a, a group, a cohort that went in under affirmative action in 1976. And it showed what the, what they found there in that in that book was out of the 700 people that they studied, that at the end of that college cohort's experience, over 30 percent had ended up with advanced or professional degrees, over 300 of them had become civic leaders, and I think around 120 had become business leaders. I have it somewhere in my notes. But that, that's, that's, and anyway, that's the point, not what they found. No, that is what they found. That is not what they found. I but, can tell you what they found. No, that's, that's exactly that what, is they not found. what they and, found. And, oh. and, what they, and what they showed in that study was that those rates were remarkably similar to and very close to uh, the white cohort that they compared it to. No. Yeah, that, that, the, the, that book attempted or, or, or suggested that it was measuring uh, racial preferences in higher education. What Bach and Bowen did not do, however, is to disaggregate the blacks who had been admitted <coughs> under racial preferences from the blacks who had not been admitted under racial preferences, but got into the school under the same credentials as everyone else. They never disaggregated that data. They just looped it all together and reported averages. The entire argument over affirmative action is not whether uh, blacks can, can, can do well at these schools. It's whether the blacks who are let in with lower credentials 
can do better at these schools. Bowen and Bach did not disaggregate that data. Not only did they not disaggregate it, they wouldn't release their findings so that other social scientists could check their findings and see if they could come up with the same results. That book did not do what you were suggesting it did. Well, that was the finding of the book. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you've offered a discrediting of their finding, and this is what social scientists do. They discredit each other's findings. I mean, I, I didn't come. I didn't come here. I didn't come here to really debate like the merits of affirmative action. I think that we can we can find like we can find examples of where affirmative action has succeeded, absolutely, and where it has has had benefits. C C that, I, that's really C C it's really a minimal claim. May, may I just make just add, put a finer point since we've been discussing it? Put a finer point on the question, which uh, which gets back to the question I put to you, Jason. Are you saying that affirmative action didn't help, or are you saying that affirmative action hurt, and if so, how? It's, it's, it's done more harm than good, and in a number of ways. Um, a, I, I just believe it's unconstitutional. Well, I mean, the, 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 we're talking the, about the harm or the good. The so, uh, Supreme Court will decide that. Um, but, but Regardless of whether it's, it's, it's constitutional, I think the data show that it's done more harm than good. And it's done more harm than good primarily by setting up smart kids to fail. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a study done of MIT students, black students at MIT some years ago. Uh, black students at MIT had scored in the 90th percentile on the math portion of the SAT of all kids in the country. 90th percentile. But among their peers at MIT, they were in the 10th percentile. So black students who would be hitting it out of the park at a less selective institution were struggling at MIT. You mentioned how after California ended uh, its racial preference policies in college admissions, uh, black enrollment initially fell at the flagship schools of UC Berkeley in UCLA. You're right, it did. Those students, however, went on to enroll at UC Cana Santa Cruz and UC Santa Barbara where they could handle the work and they graduated. What is the point of flunking out of Berkeley instead of graduating from UC Santa Barbara? What is the point of flunking out of MIT or struggling, having to switch to an easier major rather than graduating in the major you want to study in from the institution. And that's what I mean when I say that it has set up smart kids to fail. It is not about these kids not being smart, not being able to handle the work anywhere, not belonging in college. Mm -hmm. It's about whether they can handle the pace. And it's, it, it has to do, and it doesn't, it's, it's not limited to race. Um, uh, students who are let in because their parents went to the school, legacies. Students who are let in because of athletic ability, with, with lower credentials than the average student, also struggle at these schools. If, if you decided to let in left-handed blondes with lower credentials than the average student at Harvard, you would see left-handed blondes concentrating in the bottom of their class. You would see them uh, uh, struggling uh, with the work. You would see them dropping out at higher rates. That is what is being done to black people in the name of helping them. No reflection on the like. Well, okay. The, we at least we have the, the the difference is clear, and you may be able to speak. Do you want to make a comment, or can we go to a question, Nikhil? Yeah. I mean, I I don't have that much more to say about it. I okay. Th I think we put like way too much emphasis on affirmative okay. action. Okay. All right. I mean, that hasn't really been the the, the sort of weight. Of, of the arguments that I've been making tonight at all about progressive well, policy. Well, I've, I've it's harped one, on it because it's, it's a progressive it, policy. It, it is one progressive policy, yeah. and it's one progressive policy that has had some benefits, and it's certainly one progressive policy that has uh, in, engendered a very large amount of contention, and it's probably about to be ruled unconstitutional. Um, yeah, well, okay, fair enough. Uh, um, this, uh, but, but there's also a way, I mean, I mean, the, the military has been one of the biggest institutions that's been in support of affirmative action. Uh, affirmative action has really been about diversifying pathways to leadership. That's why people end up focusing on these, these very elite institutions. 
Now, has that, has that occurred in, in some institutions? Is the military a good example of having successfully established pathways to leadership uh, by using what they would admit is affirmative action? Absolutely. So I don't know if you want to contradict the whole idea of the, what the US military has done as an institution, one of the most respected institutions in American society. I mean, go ahead. But I would say that Liberty those are probably, those are probably examples of success. You, so, so I'm not saying that it's the only. I'm not saying it's the only thing that we should be hinging this argument on. You know, I think there are actually really legitimate agreements. To disagree, I mean, legitimate disagreements to have about affirmative action. And I know why people get so upset about it. it seems it, it 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 really is a contradictory policy. We should be a race blind society, and then we find that we have to take race into account to deal with something like this. But you know, it's 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 a very. I mean, we should have a separate debate on this topic because okay. it could go on and on.